to our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid, where we talk to researchers previously funded by Australian Rotary Health about their research findings. I'm Jessica Cooper, and today on episode seven, we have a very special guest with us, Professor Tony Jorm from the University of Melbourne. Professor Jorm has received a few Australian Rotary Health mental health research grants over the years, and a couple of these grants had a particular focus on developing standards and testing the effectiveness of mental health first aid, which is a very well-known training program across the world today. Professor Jorm is an Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne and NHMRC Leadership Fellow. His research focuses on building the community's capacity for prevention and early intervention with mental disorders. Professor Jorm is the author of 34 books or monographs, over 600 journal articles, and over 30 chapters in edited volumes. He has been awarded a Doctor of Science for his research and elected a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia. He is Editor-in-Chief of Mental Health and Prevention and an Associate Editor of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry. He has also previously been Chair of the Research Committee of Australian Rotary Health and remains a member of the committee today. So thank you very much, Tony, for joining us on this week's podcast episode. How's everything been going for you lately? Really good. I'm working from home and fortunately I'm able to do my work from home uh, pretty much the same as I did before when I used to go into the university. So it's been quite good for me yeah. and I've enjoyed the relaxing atmosphere at home and I get to interact with my wife, Betty, more at home, which is great. So and I've probably been exercising more as well. So for me, it's been a lot of positives. Yeah, yeah, well, it's yeah, it's good. I guess it's probably different for everyone. Some people find exactly. you know, it's very mm. beneficial. You know, some people might not be coping, but yeah, it's good to hear that it's going well for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, w- with your um, extensive background in mental health research, I'm sure many people have been asking you to provide some tips for mental health um, during this pandemic. I know I asked you around March when all of this started and you provided some great advice on coping with COVID-19 anxiety, um, which we shared on our website and our e-newsletters. And I was just wondering if you had anything else to share since then. Well, what, one interesting thing that's occurred is we've got some initial data on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the Australian population because the Australian Bureau of Statistics did a a national survey not long ago um, looking at symptoms of anxiety and depression and were able to compare them with uh, previous national survey data that they've done. And what this found is there has been some increase in anxiety symptoms. So people are are getting um, a bit more restless and a little bit more nervous about things. But more serious symptoms of mental ill health, like depression symptoms, haven't increased. In fact, one symptom that is feeling depressed has actually gone down significantly. Mm. So what we're seeing is um, an increase in anxiety, um, not of a serious level, and more serious symptoms uh, have not increased, maybe even a trend down in some cases. So it's looking quite positive. Mm. I mean, the thing we've got to remember is that anxiety is not a bad thing. Anxiety is very good. It's a useful emotion. Uh, It protects us from danger. It um, motivates us to take action. So when, when we're in a situation like with a pandemic where there's a danger of infection, anxiety is actually a major protective factor. Mm. And we only need to be concerned about it when it begins to become too much of a good thing. So if people are not able to fulfil their normal social roles, it's disrupting their family relationships or their personal relationships or the ability to work or they're getting severe symptoms like panic attacks which make it difficult for them to go outside, for example. That's when we should be concerned. But, you know, milder levels of anxiety we should see as a good thing and accept as something that is protecting us. Yeah, yeah, Um, absolutely. The the other thing I would say, uh, consistent with the advice I gave earlier, is that people manage to regulate their... uh, 
negative emotions like anxiety quite well, through, often through self-help strategies. And people have a whole lot of strategies they use that, that, that are helpful in their everyday life, like we talk to a caring person, you know, we engage in physical activity or exercise. People have various relaxation methods they might use, like they might do meditation or something like that, or yoga. And they're all very good strategies. I mean, the thing to avoid is um, use of alcohol or other substances that people often use to cope with anxiety, which actually, in the short term, they do reduce anxiety. In the long term, they actually make it worse. Mm. Um, so you've got to avoid those sort of self-defeating strategies. But people need to look at self-help as the initial, uh, the initial approach, and professional help only is needed really when it gets totally out of control and beyond their ability to manage it with their, their usual self-help strategies. Mm. Yeah, that, that's really good advice. I, I think a, a lot of people, you know, they start to feel anxious in these situations and they think that there's something wrong with them, but it's actually quite normal. So. Yeah, I, I'd compare anxiety. It's like the immune response. The immune response protects us from infection. It's a very good thing. But sometimes the immune response goes into an overdrive and it can attack the body or produce uh, unwanted effects. But that's the exception rather than the rule. On the whole, it's a good thing. Mm. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, I guess before before we get into the research side of things, I'm sure many people have heard of mental health first aid before, but um, can you give us just a bit of a summary of what the program is and, and how widespread it has become since it first started? Yeah, okay. Well, mental health first aid uh, teaches members of the public um, how to provide initial assistance to somebody who's in a mental health crisis situation. For example, they're suicidal, self-harming, out of contact with reality, having a panic attack, acutely intoxicated, or they're developing a mental health problem, like they're becoming depressed or something like that. Um, and it teaches how to give, how to have a conversation with that person, how to approach them about your concerns, about how they're going, um, how to listen to them in a supportive way without judgment, um, how to give them information about better ways of coping, how to assist them to get professional help and how to build social and self-help supports around the person. So it's very much analogous to physical first aid, which deals with uh, physical health emergencies, but it deals with uh, mental health emergencies. But I suppose the way it's different is that we don't wait until the person gets becomes suicidal or... or uh, you know, out of contact with reality. We don't wait to get serious. We try and do early intervention as well and try and get it to that, get intervene and help the person at that point where it's beginning to interfere with their life in general, not wait for a crisis to occur. Mm, yeah, that's, yeah, it's very important. And so how, how many people use mental health first aid? Um, well, mental first aid um, started out quite small at the time. It started out uh, a conversation between my wife, Betty Kitchener, and I when we were walking our dog back in the late 1990s. And um, Betty um, was a, a first aid instructor for Red Cross, and she trained as a teacher and as a nurse and also had a history of depression, starting with adolescence. So I had a personal interest. And we had a conversation about why courses like Red Cross First Aid don't cover how you help, say, somebody who was suicidal, having a panic attack. And we thought this was a real gap. And so we um, thought, well, this is something we could develop and we do it like on the weekend, you know, a couple of courses a year in Canberra, which is where we lived then, um, basically as a community service activity. Um, but then in we, we didn't really get time to do it. So then in 2000, Betty, who then worked at Canberra Hospital, reduced her paid working hours and started as a volunteer. But she was the first. Uh, mental health first aid instructor and she developed a course and ran the first course in the year 2000 mm. and I'm a researcher so I began doing research on the course to look at its effects and made sure the content was heavily evidence-based and then it just grew and grew in ways we didn't expect. So uh, currently I think there are over 800,000 people in Australia who have done a mental health first aid course. Wow. Um, it's over 3 million people worldwide and, and mental health first aid courses now taught by organisations in, I think, it's nearly 30 countries. So it's just growing rapidly in ways that we never expected. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I myself have done a mental health first aid course and I know a couple of people in our office have and I, I'm sure many Rotarians have as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a really great thing to, to really provide to the community. And 
yeah, it really informs people about mental health that they wouldn't have known. Um, and I know um, back in back in the early days um, when, when the project was first beginning in 2005, you had a grant with us to develop the mental health first aid standards. Um, so would you like to tell us a bit about what you were trying to achieve um, with this specific uh, grant project? Yes. Well, when we began mental health first aid um, and Betty developed the first curriculum, we had to figure out, well, what do you do as a lay person, <clears throat> for example, to help someone who's your concern might be suicidal. And um, what we found was that there was evidence around on what professionals could do, like clinicians could do, but not what a lay person could do. So very limited evidence to base the advice on. So what we did was informally, we would talk to experts. So I knew somebody who was expert in um, dealing with people who had had traumatic experiences. So I asked him, you know, what would you do if you're a lay person and somebody had had some really bad thing happen to them? What do you do to support them? I, I talked with someone who was an expert on substance misuse and asked them what you would do there. Uh, we scoured what literature there was and where there was nothing else, we used common sense and the basic principle was it's good to be kind to people. But we realised that this is not a good basis to uh, have for the content of a first aid course. So then we looked at, well, what are Red Cross and St John and organisations like that do? Like, <clears throat> how do they know this is how you should do CPR? How do they know this is what you do for a snake bite or a burn or something? Mm -hmm. And what we found was that there is an international organisation called ILCOR, I-L-C-O-R, it's an acronym for something in French. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it, it creates international guidelines for best practice in first aid, which are updates regularly and then organizations like Red Cross and St John's teach to those uh, guidelines. So what we realized is we needed something similar for mental health first aid and at first we called them standards but then we changed the terminology and called them guidelines. Mm. So we thought well how can you get uh, best practice in those areas? So if you want to um, research a treatment <clears throat> the best evidence you get is from a randomized controlled trial and you randomise people to some treatment or a control. But with first aid strategies, you can't do that. You can't say, well, here's some lay people. If you have someone you know who's suicidal, you do this. And other people, we say, well, you do something else. It's just not possible to do that. So we thought that the best evidence would be practice-based evidence. Find out people who are doing this regularly, have learned from their practical experience and try and draw on that in a systematic way. So what we did was to, to use a method called the Delphi method, which is a way of getting expert consensus. And the experts we drew on were, were clinicians. So, for example, if we wanted to find out what's the best way to help someone that's suicidal, if you're a lay person and you're concerned, we asked people who were suicide experts. And we also asked people who had had personal experience, people who had been suicidal and become consumer advocates or people who had been carers of somebody and become a carer advocate. So we were tapping into the experience of both professionals and people who had personal experience, either in themselves or somebody close to them. So that was the basis of the guidelines. So what we did was we would come up with a big menu of claims that people had made that this is a good thing to do as a first aid strategy. And we made these long questionnaires, some of which said contradictory things, and some of them said things that we think were bad things to do, but we didn't judge it. And then we let the experts say, should this be taught in mental health first aid? And we took strategies that at least 80% of both the professionals and the people with personal experience um, said were useful things to do and used those as the basis of the guidelines, which is then the basis of what's taught in mental health first aid courses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I guess um, this, these guidelines, they, they helped to make the program what it is today. Are you, are you still using all of these guidelines? We are indeed. So we, we rewrote the course to do a second edition, which is totally based around the guidelines. Uh, fortunately, we found that what we were teaching in the first edition, there was nothing bad in it, but what we got was more extensive advice on what to do than we, were, we had, and we had a very good basis. So you can look at anything in a mental health first aid course and you say, well, why are you teaching people to do that? And we can give a very precise answer. We can say, 
because we got this group of experts who had either professional or lived experience of this problem, and at least 80% of the both groups said this is a good thing to do. So it's not just our opinion. Mm. So everything that's taught in mental health state courses, both in Australia and globally, is based around those guidelines which were funded by Australian Rotary Health. So more recently, we've been revising all the guidelines, so uh, people's um, understanding and expertise in these areas changes at times. We're aiming that every decade we go through a new cycle. So we're now in well into the second cycle of guidelines. So the Australian Rotary Health ones were the first, um, the first cycle. And what, what's happened in the second cycle is adding more detail. So we're getting much more detailed advice uh, over time. As people are getting more familiar, I guess, with the role of a mental health first aider versus a professional role. Um, so, so I think we're, we're getting much more detailed advice that we can train people in now, these ex new expert consensus guidelines. Yeah, no, oh, excellent. That sounds really great. And um, I, I know a few years later in, in 2008, um, we, we also awarded another research grant um, for you to test whether mental health first aid training was effective in an e-learning format. How important was this particular development at the time? Well, I think one of the... Um, the limitations of uh, first aid training like mental health aid, which requires a 12 hour commitment of time, is that not everybody can easily do that. Like if you live in a rural or remote area, to be able to travel into a class could be quite difficult. Um, for people who have long young children, you know, to actually you know, arrange for childcare and so on to, to be able to attend, or for people in, in workplaces, like in some workplaces, if somebody's not at their job, like if you're a teacher or a nurse and you're not doing your job, somebody's got to be paid to fill in for you while you do the course. So this is a limitation of face-to-face -face courses. So we wondered how you would go uh, doing middle of the state by e-learning. And certainly physical first aid does use e-learning approaches. So what we got funding for from Australian Rotary Health was a randomised controlled trial where people either did mental health first aid by e-learning, which we developed, um, or they read the mental health state manual, so they did it in, in paper form, or they were in a control group who were on a weighted list before they did um, training. And we found the e-learning, both the e-learning and reading the book were effective, but e-learning was better than, than reading the book, so that gave us encouragement. So when we did the first e-learning, we did it on CD-ROM. People might remember CD-ROMs, and that was because at that time, internet access was not good for everybody. Right? There were people who had dial-up and people in rural areas had very poor internet access. So we thought CD-ROM was a better way to go. But more recently, it's all moved over to the internet. Now we've got the NBN and so on, and people have better internet access. So it's now all done um, over the internet. And more recently, we've moved to explore blended learning. So we got the, subsequently got a grant from the National Health and Medical Research Council to compare blended learning, which is where you get the knowledge component through e-learning, and then you have a smaller, shorter face-to-face -face component for the skills component. And we compare that blended e-learning plus smaller face-to-face -face with uh, e-learning alone and with a control group who, who did a physical first aid by e-learning. And uh, uh, we found both e-learning and blended were good, but um, People preferred the blended and they seemed to have longer term retention of the knowledge and skills if they did it by blended. So that looked like a, you know, a superior approach. Yeah, well, yeah. I guess it's, it's very important to, to do that comparison and, and do the research to make sure that you're giving people you know, the best possible you know, chance to retain that knowledge. So, yeah, that, that's really good. Um, I guess um, like it looks like there's developments of mental health first aid quite regularly. I know we recently provided funding to Dr. Laura Hart to develop the program for teenagers, um, teen mental health first aid. Um, was there any other research developments for, for mental health research, uh, mental health first aid um, like, like this or, you know, something similar? Uh, there have been a lot, but, I mean, the, the original innovation in mental health state came from my wife, Betty Kitchener, but, you know, other people have now moved into the space and they're the innovators and the teen mental health first aid program was created by Laura Hart and also uh, Claire Kelly, Dr. Claire Kelly, who, who was supported by Australian Rotary Health in a, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, some years ago. So both Laura and Claire have, and they developed the teen mental health first aid program. 
And uh, the reason that they developed this is because uh, mental, health, mental health problems often first develop uh, during adolescence. And when we've done surveys with adolescents to ask what would you do if you developed a you know, problem like depression, for example, a lot of them say they would talk to their friends about it. Now, that's not an ideal thing to do because the friend is young, they don't have experience, they don't have the knowledge to assist you. It'd be far better that you spoke to a knowledgeable and supportive adult. But the reality is they do talk to their friends. So uh, Laura and Claire therefore developed this training, Teen Mental Health First Aid, which is um, basic supportive things an adolescent can do to support one of their peers, but a key message is that they must connect the person to a responsible adult. So don't take on full, be supportive, but don't take on full responsibility yourself. This is for an adult to do. Mm. So Teen Mental State is a school-based program. It involves three uh, lessons for high school students. Initially, it's students in years um, 10 to 12, just for high school. And because of the, you know, this message, connect to a responsible adult, the adults also have to be trained. So the teachers in the school have to do youth mental health first aid training, which is for adults to assist adolescents. And it's also offered to the parents if they want it as well. So that if, if an adolescent does go to the teacher or a parent, they know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, so Australian Military Health funded um, a small randomised controlled trial of um, teen mental health first aid, where it was compared to... Um, physical first aid course based on sort of sporting injuries and other physical health emergencies that teenagers often um, have. And um, a lot of benefits were found from that training. It was uh, very successful. And subsequently we got a, on the basis of the findings from the Australian Rotary Health Trial, we got a grant from the National Health and Medical Research Council for a much bigger trial, which is uh, still ongoing. And uh, the findings of the Australian Rotary Health Trial uh, led to a greater dissemination of teen mental first aid. It's now spreading uh, rapidly in Australia and it's gone to another a number of other countries, um, including the United States. So uh, Lady Gaga, the pop singer, has a foundation there and she was very interested in supporting it. So it's funded a rollout of trial of it in a number of schools in the US and that got enormous publicity. And other countries are taking it on as well. So it's, uh, it's beginning to show the same sort of success that the what we now call the standard mental health first aid program for adults to, to assist uh, other adults has had. And uh, the, the people who produced that um, innovation, Laura Hart and Claire Kelly, both have received salary support from IRH and it wouldn't have been possible for them to do that work without that support. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's always great to see that, you know, just just putting in a, a small amount of funding can, can lead to something much bigger. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's amazing that this has happened just from, you know, a couple of grants from Australian Rotary Health. And um, like, would you have any comments on the importance of Rotarians or other Australians donating to mental health research, even if they may seem like small projects at, at the beginning? And also, I guess, especially now that we don't quite know what the impacts of COVID-19 will be on our long-term mental health. Well, I think the basic message I always want to give to people that aren't involved in research is it's extremely difficult to get any funding. And the success rates in people that apply for grants um, in medical research are very low. You, you know, typical might be 10 to 15%. And, um, the ones that don't get funded aren't rubbish. You know, most of them are very good applications. It is just so hard. And it's getting harder and harder over time. It's just getting the success rates getting worse and worse and worse. Um, so it is very hard to get support for this sort of research. And I think, um, you know, Australian Rotary Health has played a very important role in the mental health area because it has been historically an even more underfunded area of research. Um, Australian Rotary Health moved into that area around 2000, I think it was, so they've been involved in around 20 years. And it has become, a, you know, although it's much smaller than the government schemes like National Health and Medical Research Council, it has a very important role because in, in mental health research, we have not had um, the sort of support areas like heart disease and cancer have had, you know, things like the Heart Foundation, the Cancer Council have funding schemes 
which which are well supported for many years. We've not had that, and Australian Rotary Club has, has moved into that role. It's 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 been the the, the big non-government supporter, um, and it's it's been uh, I think it, it's not just funding the things that NHMRC and other government agencies haven't funded. It's got its own niche. So mental health problems often start um, during childhood or adolescence. And um, Australian Rotary Health was specialised in child, adolescent and youth um, mental health problems. And also it's focused very heavily on intervention research. So it's not just describing the problem or trying to understand how the problem arose, but what can we practically do? So it supported very practical intervention research in mental first aid is one of those. Um, and although the grants offered by Australian Rotary Health are a lot smaller than you get from NHMRC, to get an NHMRC grant, you often need to have the this, this small trial done to give you the money for the big trial. And that's happened in the examples I've had, like teen mental health first aid and also the e-learning mental health state. In both those cases, we got much bigger grants, which we wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. The other thing I'd say about Australian Rotary Health is it's very good at supporting younger researchers. It's very hard when you're starting out in research with these low success rates and uh, Australian Rotary Health has been important through offering the PhD uh, scholarships and the postdoctoral uh, fellowships to young researchers that have given them a chance. They need those early years to be able to build up their track records and get the connections and get the expertise that then they can have a chance at being competitive in a very very, very uh, um, competitive uh, field. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely is a competitive process. Just just being on the research committee, I'm sure you could, you know, see that firsthand as well, you know, the amount of applications yeah. that we get and how many people we actually award funding to. It's um, it's quite a, a yeah, a difficult process. <laughs> But, um, it's, it's a very difficult process and it's, it's hard when you realise how much work people put into those applications and, and most of them don't get funded. So mm -hmm. there's certainly a lot more that could be funded if the funding existed, but that's, yeah. that's why we need fundraising to do that, Absolutely. to fill that gap. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thank you for joining us on our seventh episode of our podcast today, Tony. It's, it's been great having you here and, and talking about your research. Um, so was there anything else that you wanted to add just before we wrap up? I just, you know, as a Rotarian myself, I'd like to thank all the um, Rotarians who raise all the money because I know how much work goes into it all uh, at, the, at the club level. And people have been very generous uh, with their time and their fundraising. Um, and I just want to say I really appreciate it. And also the um, people on the board, uh, people have all been district governors in Rotary and they give very generously of their time to do it. And I have to say, over the years, having been involved, I think, for 20 years now with ARH and the staff in Parramatta, how they're great people. Thank them for all their work over the years. It's been wonderful to deal with them all. Well, thank you. And, yeah, you've been great, all of your, yeah. It's been, yeah, it's been wonderful. So thanks again. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you for being right. here for the seventh episode of our podcast called The Research Behind Lift the Lid. It's always so inspiring to hear what researchers in Australia are doing to make a difference to mental health and how they are helping us on our mission to lift the lid on mental illness. If you would like to help more mental health research like Dr. John's continue, please consider donating to our COVID-19 appeal. We have an aim to raise $200,000 by June 30, so your support would be very much appreciated. Please see the link to donate on our Australian Rotary Health Facebook page. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time.